I'm not really a traditional type of person. I don't care too much for traditions, even church traditions. However, that being said, I do think this time of year is, is just so good to look at um, what we know happened at this time of year, thinking of our Lord's crucifixion and, and burial and resurrection. And I know Resurrection Sunday is next week. And I think, and it, it's not something that I've actually really checked out to be perfectly honest with you so I hope that it's right that this would be considered Palm Sunday if that's right yeah good. and I think you know it's, it's it's a church tradition obviously because when you look at it that really was only four days before the Passover so it's not that seven days apart as it would be on the church calendar but I thought it'd be a good opportunity before we do um arrive at Resurrection Sunday next week to look at what I would like to describe as the inspection of the Lamb this morning. Because there was a period, as we'll see, before the lambs were sacrificed on Passover, there was a great inspection process that took place and how this played out in our Lord's life as he made his way to Jerusalem. And the things that happened in those last few days. So if you've got your Bibles, if you would just like to start by turning to Exodus and chapter 12. And this is the, the great chapter where the Lord starts to explain about the Passover sacrifice. That Israel were about to um, do for the first time as they were about to leave Egypt. And in verse 4, sorry, let's look at verses 3 to 6. So Exodus 12, verses 3 to 6. The Lord said, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are to take one lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for the lamb, then he is then he and his nearest neighbour are to take one according to the number of the persons in them, according to what each man should eat, and you are to divide the lamb. Now verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or for the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So we've got on the tenth of the month, the first month this was for the Jews, they were to separate a lamb for themselves on the tenth of the month. Then as we'll see there was an inspection pit process over four days to make sure that that lamb was spotless and unblemished, that it would qualify as a lamb for sacrifice. And then on the 14th of the month, on the day of the actual Passover, that was when they sacrificed the lamb at twilight. Now, if you could turn, we're going to read a few verses, if we could turn to Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament, in chapter 9. So we've read about the separation of the lamb in those four days. And then just a very short passage in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. I know this might start to sound familiar. Worth just reminding ourselves that Zechariah would have prophesied this round about 500 years before Christ was born. So the Lord prophesying through Zechariah 500 years before Jesus was born says, Rejoice, O greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now listen. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So in Exodus 12, we've seen the lamb. In Zechariah 9, we've seen a king. But not just any king, if you look carefully, it says, Your king, daughters of Jerusalem. He's the king of Israel, coming humbly 
Not triumphantly on a horse, or a white horse, but on a donkey. Now if we could go forward to John's Gospel, chapter 1. Verse 29. So now, about 500 years later after that prophecy, it says in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus. So this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of of the world so we read about those sacrificial lambs in Exodus 12 the setting apart of the lamb on the 10th the four day preparation period the prophecy in Zechariah that a king would come and enter Jerusalem on a donkey humbly we've seen John the Baptist's witness that Jesus Christ was the lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. Now, it's good to read the scriptures, isn't it? Matthew 21. And this will kind of tie this together. Matthew 21. Now, without, without going into the detail, which I could do to save time, if you could... Please take me word for it that Matthew 21 is on the 10th of the first month. It's those four or five days before the Passover. So now Matthew 21 happened on that day that we read about in Exodus 12 when the lamb was to be set apart four days before Passover. This is what takes place in Matthew 21. Verse 1, and we just read to verse 11. And when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said, sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And the multitudes going before him and those followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now this passage is sometimes what is referred to as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I think maybe there's a sense that that can be true, but it's not in the sense that most people think. If I can just run through this passage a little bit and point out a few bits and bobs. I found it interesting in verse 1 that Jesus had come to a place called Bethphage. In Hebrew, it means house of the unripe figs. And I believe that is significant because if you think back to passages in the Old Testament time and time again, figs or the fig tree is used as a representation of the nation of Israel. Being an unripe fig, I believe, is signifying what becomes evidently true is that Israel were not ready. The Lord was ready, and he was bang on time. But Israel were not ready to receive him. It might sound like they're receiving him here, but it's not the case. 
He comes humbly. He is the rightful king, the rightful king of Israel, and he comes humbly on a donkey. And this is what fulfills that prophecy in Zechariah that we read 500 years earlier. But it comes with a difference. He is not really coming in triumph. The triumph really happens at the cross. But it sounds like they are coming and accepting him. And if you notice, when they're waving their branches about, John's Gospel says it specifies that these are palm branches. And if you go back to Exodus, uh, sorry, Leviticus, Israel had something called the Feast of Tabernacles. And this signified the kingdom. When we read about the Feast of Tabernacles, it's the tabernacles that signify the kingdom of heaven. So it appears that they think the kingdom is now coming. This is the Messiah. This is the expected one. And just like in the Transfiguration a few chapters earlier, Peter tried to set up tabernacles for Jesus, for Elijah, for Moses, thinking that this is it, the kingdom has come. And so what happens when you think the kingdom has come? This is the fulfillment of tabernacles. You get the palm branches out because that's what they were told to do at the Feast of Tabernacles. Make little huts for yourself, have the roofs with the the palm branches. But they didn't realise, and just like even the disciples didn't realise at the time, that this wasn't the time for the kingdom to come. It wasn't the time for tabernacles. It was actually Passover, and it really was Passover. The lamb had to be sacrificed. And I think it's interesting that even in the church, We know that there's a problem in the church of thinking that the kingdom has already come. There's a a millennialism, kingdom now stuff. And I just want you to think about this for a minute. We know we've had Passover. Christ came and died. We know we've had Passover. And the unleavened bread and the first fruits that followed. We know we've had Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. Back when the church was birthed. But how can the kingdom have come? How can we have had tabernacles if there's not been the trumpets? There's not been the day of atonement? The regathering of Israel and their repentance, their mourning? We've clearly not had those yet. So how on earth has the kingdom come? Because that's tabernacles and that's what they thought was going on here. We've got the same problem in the church. But... Jesus makes it patently clear that he has not come to establish the kingdom for Israel yet. And we see this, I think, most clearly. Don't worry about turning there if you don't want, but I'll just flick forwards to Luke. And in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 19, and verse 39, the same passage, we're dealing with the same passage in Luke's Gospel. They have just pronounced, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees pull Jesus up and they say, listen, listen to the multitudes. Teacher, rebuke them for what they're saying. Why were the Pharisees so bothered? Because this was a recognition by declaring from Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the Messiah. This is the king who is coming. And the Pharisees didn't like that one bit. So they told Jesus, do you tell them? And Jesus answered in verse 40 and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now listen, does this sound like Jesus is coming off in the kingdom on his donkey? And when he approached, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, this is Jesus speaking to the people of Jerusalem, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, For the things shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground with your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Does that sound like the Lord Jesus is coming offering to establish the kingdom for Israel? He's telling them what's going to happen. And every detail of that short passage there 
happened in a very, very literal way. In a very literal way. Jerusalem was surrounded in 70 AD. They were hemmed in. When pregnant women had the children ripped out of them. Cannibalism took place because they were starved out essentially. And an almighty atrocity came upon the nation which Jesus prophesied would take place. There was a warning about it. Those who listened to the warning and were faithful escaped. But those who didn't, didn't suffered these consequences that Jesus warned them would happen. The time of their visitation, I think I just need to mention something about this as well. The time of their visitation. The day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey was also prophesied over 500 years before it happened. To the day, there's the most amazing prophecy in the book of Daniel in chapter 9. Where they should have known, really, that he wasn't coming in victorious there. That he had to come and die. Because the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 said that the Messiah, after 69 prophetic weeks, would be cut off. Meaning he would be killed. And so this Entry into Jerusalem being proclaimed as king marks the end of those 69 sevens, those 69 weeks, the time when that finishes. It's astounding. One day we'll maybe get into it because it's the most amazing prophecy. They didn't recognize the time of their visitation. And so when they are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, And then what happens four days later? The multitude is shouting, crucify him. And as much as Pilate's trying to release him, they're saying, no, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Four days earlier, they're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they're saying, we've got no king but Caesar. The next day, from chapter 21, the next day, if you follow it through, As Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem and pronouncing this judgment, he says to them, you shall not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's in Matthew 23, 39. So Jesus is saying Israel will receive him as their king. The kingdom will come and it will be based on Israel again proclaiming, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the day after they pronounce this, Jesus condemns them and says, you won't see me until you say this again. Again, signifying the Jews have got to be back in the land of Israel for the return of the Messiah to take place. And they will pronounce this, they will repent. And like it says in Romans 11, thus all Israel shall be saved. But (laughs) there was a lot in between. Now then, we spoke where we started off In Exodus 12, there was four days of inspecting the lamb. Now, I don't know if you've heard, if you can just bear with me for a minute. Israel, there are people in Israel that are trying to re-establish temple service in Israel. And one of the things they have to do to re-establish temple service in Israel, they need a red heifer. You have to burn a red heifer and have the ashes to cleanse and purify things. So they can't do anything without this red heifer. And there's been many attempts over the years to get one. And a short while back, they imported five red heifers from Texas, of all places. And there's a process now where they've got to wait for these red heifers to mature till three years old, so they're actually classed as a heifer. And they have to... It's got to be a bit like the lamb. It's got to be perfect. It can't have a single blemish on it. And when I was reading, apparently what that means is if they find one hair... On this red heifer that's not red, white or black or grey, no good. (laughs) That's going to take some time, isn't it? So if there was anything like that rigorous inspection process of these lambs, it's quite something. What I understand at the time of Jesus, there were 70 checks that were made for the lambs. So they would, over that period of three days, a lamb that was brought for sacrifice on Passover... 70 checks were made. What I found amazing looking at this, 
following on from Matthew 21. Over the next four days in Jesus' life, these last few days of his life, he was inspected. The sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, was also tried and tested and inspected on numerous occasions over the next four days. And if I can quickly just run through them, don't worry if you can't find them, but I will just read very quickly. So going back to Matthew 21 and verse 23. Jesus' authority is challenged. The chief priests and the elders, and that's significant. In verse 23, the chief priests and the elders come to him saying, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? They're testing him. Matthew 22, verse 15. And the Pharisees went and counseled together how they might trap him in what he said. They're testing him, they're trying to catch him out, they're inspecting him, they're trying to figure out how they might entrap him. Verse 23, on that day some Sadducees, we're now looking at the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to him and questioned him. So now the Sadducees are testing him, they're inspecting him. Verse 34 of the same chapter. Oh, sorry, let me beg your pardon. Let me back up to verse 16. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians in verse 16 of Matthew 22. So the Herodians are inspecting him. And then verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, Jesus, he completely shut the Sadducees up. They gathered together and said, And one of them, a scribe, asked him a question, testing him. So now you've got a scribe, one of the lawyers, testing him. Everything in God's word means something and has significance. We've gone through the lot of the Jewish leaders, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the, the scribes, the Sadducees, all of them. Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't get on, and the Herodians didn't get on with him, but they all came together to get rid of him, to test him, and to get rid of him. And if you just have a quick look down to verse 46, Jesus passes every one of these inspections, so much so that when you get to verse 46, Matthew says, and no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on Ask him another question. He was the perfect spotless lamb. They couldn't test him, trip him up, catch him in any kind of way. And it went further. What happened? The only way that they could get to him was to get false witnesses. False witnesses. I remember a while back of all people hearing a sermon by Ian Paisley. Now, I'm not saying anything for him or against him, but he made out what I thought, because I'm, I'm, I'm not taking the credit for this. Saying, if you really want to know the truth about somebody, it's always worth listening to what their enemies say about them. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. And if we do that, we can see <laughs> what is said. So, <coughs> excuse me. If we, we're nearly finished. If we skip forward to Matthew 27. It might be Matthew 26, I beg your pardon. Yeah, it's Matthew 26, 59. Matthew 26, 59. So Jesus is now on trial. The Lamb of God is now on trial. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death and they didn't find any they couldn't find anybody who had anybody who could really say anything against him so they had to find liars they had to find liars so we've got false witnesses next Judas his betrayer the ultimate betrayer 
Verse tw uh, chapter 27, what did Judas, what was Judas' testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ after he betrayed him? Verse 4, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. That was his chief betrayer's testimony about Jesus. Innocent blood. That lamb has innocent blood. Now what about Pilate's missus? Pilate's wife, what does she say about him? Verse 19 of 27. And while he was sitting in the judgment seat, that's Pilate, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. She testifies that he's righteous. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. She's telling her husband, Pilate, leave him alone. He's a righteous man. And this dream, I didn't like this dream I had. What about Pilate himself? What was Pilate's testimony about the Lord? It's got something there in Matthew, but even more clearly in Luke 23, verses 13 to 15. And Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges you made against him. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, no, Nor has Herod, for he sent him back to me. Behold, he has done nothing deserving death. That's Pilate's testimony, the one who actually gave the okay to crucify him. Herod's testimony. Let me put it to you that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, was found to be absolutely spotless, perfect, beyond all reproach. Even his enemies couldn't hang a single thing on him. And this is our Saviour. This is the one who was by himself walking to his slaughter. And he was tested on those four days, just like that amazing picture we see of the sacrificial lambs all the way back going to Exodus. And just to finish, we've had man's testimony of him. But what about his father's testimony? There's a verse in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, I believe it is. Chapter 4, I beg your pardon. Verse 15, Hebrews 4, verse 15. So this is God through the Holy Spirit speaking in the book of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest. The Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in all things as we are, yet he was without sin. He was tested in all things, yet found to be without sin. That was why he qualified as the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that was acceptable to the Father that could pay for our sins. And this means everything to us. Absolutely everything. And Lord willing, we'll actually look at the sacrifice next week. I'm just going to close in a prayer.